Kia ora koutou. That was not an introduction I expected. I'm not sure I can live up to all of that, but thank you anyway. Look, it is my pleasure to be here with you today and to touch on some things in relation to farm planning for you. Uh, and I'll just try and do that to give you an overview of some of the things that are going on and the opportunities that they create for us, because I see it very much that way. These are opportunities in front of us, and that's what I want to try and do today. So let me just get myself organised here. Alright, I want to set the scene a little bit by saying that where there's change there's opportunity and there's so much going on all the time that we could look at all of those things around us and we've always got a choice in terms of how we respond. Do we react positively? Do we look for the opportunity? Or do we take a different approach? And I want to suggest that there's always an opportunity for us in what's there. We might have to look a little harder sometimes than we want to find it, but we should always look for the opportunity. Um, you'll also recall, I'm sure, that Winston Churchill said, a pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity, an optimist sees opportunity in every difficulty. And so if we start with that framework, we can look at the things that are being uh, asked of us now or coming our way and look at them and see where's the opportunity in this for my business for where I'm at. also want to refer to this quote that Eisenhower is attributed to, although he actually uh, he attributes it to an anonymous soldier, but he says that plans are nothing, planning is everything. And so I ask you to hold those two thoughts in mind as I talk with you a little about farm planning for the next short period of time. What we're really wanting to do from now on is uh, document our planning. And so you've always been involved in planning. You're here this today because of planning. What we're asked to do now a little more in terms of our farming business is to document some of that planning that we've always been doing. Show, create the evidence to show the things that we've thought through, the risks that we've assessed, the processes we've put in place. There's also lots of talk and noise around planning and lots of different words used in relation to planning. Lots of phrases, lots of plan requirements. What's really important is to work out where they fit for us and how they can work together and how we can make the most out of all of those things. Not individually, but to seek again how they can further help us make better decisions on farm. But we've got things like winter grazing with planning requirements, fresh water farm plan requirements, greenhouse gas farm plans, regional council plans, and just this week, integrated farm planning. So there's lots of discussion out around farm planning, but where does it fit for us? And as we heard a moment ago, consumers also asking about some of the practices that we employ on farm, how is their food produced, and what evidence can we provide to give credibility to our claims. Here's our vision at Beef and Lamb in terms of farm planning. It's that your farm plan will help meet regulatory and market needs, turn them into opportunities. So we've developed a framework to enable farmers to plan these things in a way that is helpful and fits across the wider business. And we want to see that every commercial farm has an active recorded plan in their business. That that plan provides an opportunity to meet those regulatory and consumer requirements. That in doing that, there's a cost-effective and streamlined manner in which you can formulate that plan. Data is inf or information is entered once, used multiple times, and used for multiple processes, but always within your control. And the recorded active plans should guide on-farm decision making, improve economic resilience and overall business performance. They should help document your story and give providence to your claims. So that's our vision in terms of farm planning. Let's just look quickly at what it can look like. We always want to start when we're thinking about things like farm planning about what, is, what are we here for? What is our vision? What are our values that underpin what we're doing? Detail the resources that we have available. And then we've created a framework where there's a range of modules that we can put underneath that vision, those values. And the one we'll focus on mostly at this point is the environment module. 
But there's other things that we can sit in there, perhaps biosecurity. Maybe we'll put our health and safety module in there. Most of you will have that well documented, I'm sure. Maybe we employ a number of staff and we've got a people module, we'll put it in there as well. Because all of those aspects fit together under our vision, our values, fit together with the resources we've got. And as we work through those modules, we're going to create some actions. And those actions fit into what we call our plan. But those actions in our plan tie back up to our vision and our values because that's the way we'll get the things done that really matter to us. The environment module is something we've built from the land environment plan that Beef and Lamb's had for a number of years and a number of you have probably got on farm. But we've also added some other material to it to strengthen it and bring it up to speed with the current things that we need to fo focus on. So it think, includes things like soil health, a chapter on soil health, freshwater ecosystem health, how can we integrate native biodiversity into our business, or maybe document how we are already doing that, how we're we responding to climate change, waste and chemical management, forage and cropping, forage cropping management, etc. And for us down here, that largely means winter grazing, doesn't it? So that's the framework that we have created for the Beef and Lamb Farm Plan. There's lots of ways you can do it, do it or think about it. Just this week, MPI came out with their integrated farm plan and they put it together in this manner, but it's very similar in principle to what we created in the beef and lamb farm plan. And if this pointer works, maybe, maybe not. Anyway, up the top, they've created a, a, or identified a number of things that are going on in the wider environment for us. They then funnel those down towards the catchment, the things that are going on around our catchment, then to our, to our farm, before we start doing the typical plan do review or assess, uh, no assess, develop is the words they use, around documenting your own individual plan. So same kind of process, slightly different way of laying it out, but again thinking about all of these things together. Uh, and how they fit within our business. And that's why, from MPI's perspective, they talk about integrated farm planning. From beef and lamb perspective, most of us across the rest of the agriculture sector, we're thinking about it in those ways, just not necessarily with those words associated with it. But let's get into the detail. I'll give you a quick example. We want to start by the, thinking about those core natural resources, the core things that make up part of our farm business, the things that we've got to work with within our control uh, and that we can influence or will influence what happens around us in including leaving our farm. So we want to document those things, document our vision, document our values, collate things like soil tests, have some good maps that we can start mapping out and scheduling and sketching the things that are happening across our environment and how we can influence them. So we'd ask you to bring those together um, as we start to get our farm plan together. In terms of how you might then progress, we've got a couple of options available currently for farmers to document a farm plan through the beef and lamb farm plan process. That's either to do the entire environment module uh, as one section, in which case we'd ask you to come to a couple of workshops and we'd take you through some tools and resources that you can then use to go home, document what it looks like for your farm, start thinking about the risk assessment, working through it, creating actions, and working through it across all of those chapters that I mentioned just before, to document what is the opportunity and the risks and the actions falling out of that for your farm within your context. But we also know that there's opportunities to do it in other ways, and that's to come together around specific parts that are really critical right now. And so that might be winter grazing, as we've just focused on, to make sure we've got a good documented winter grazing plan. It might be around greenhouse gas emissions, making sure we've got that in place well, a good approach to climate change documented for our business. And shortly, we hope to offer you uh, a, the chapter around fresh water, again, to take that same process. How can we just focus on a piece that may be really critical for you, but in time you bring the others in together to create that wider farm, documented farm plan. So a quick example, here's the vision and values for a particular farm, the things that are important to them, the things that drive them. You'll notice it's dated. 
And that's important because we want to come back and periodically review those things. We then want to start thinking about and documenting what are those core resources that we have on farm. And ideally we're going to think about it not in terms of the way we've got it currently uh, fenced or managed, but what's the underlying resources that we're working with? What are the variable parts of our business and how can we describe them in terms of their risks and opportunities, their strengths and weaknesses? So things like the flats and the hills and those kind of things and how can we think about those afresh in terms of the opportunities they create for us. Having thought about that, we can then start getting into some of the detail. For example, if we're winter grazing, if we've got forage cropping going on in our business, why are we doing that? And what are the risks and opportunities that come out of that that we want to think about and make sure that we've minimised the risk, maximised the opportunity, optimised it for our system? But starting with why and any one of these things is always really important to make sure that we're doing it because it's the best strategic uh, contribution to our business. So always think about the why as we go through it. And then we can start thinking about the risks and the practices associated with it, the things that we want to do. When we think about risk assessment for forage cropping, there's a whole lot of ways that we might want to think about that and work through it. And of course, if you work through it in a workshop with us, we'll give you a folder with a whole lot of material, uh, examples and things to think of. We'll take you through that at the time. But as an example, you might have some risk around sediment and phosphorus loss. Loss. So what are the things that will contribute to that? Well, maybe there's some slope risk, maybe be, there's some erosion risk, and work through what that looks like and document it against those land management units so that we can then apply it as we go forward. And you might want to do it by paddock, but you might not want to do it by paddock if you've got a couple of hundred paddocks. So thinking about it in terms of those parts of your farm, those land management units, can be a smart and efficient way of how we document that plan. And then having identified those risks, we can then dig deeper in terms of what are my actions going to be? What am I going to do across those various land management units? Um, when am I going to do it? Who's going to do it? Noting down those things that we are doing in regard to mitigating those risks. So again, thinking about how we're documenting what we're doing. Very often we're doing these things uh, either subconsciously or through discussion there's opportunity to document it to further validate what we're doing. And having done that, we can create a map, sketch it out on a, a, on a paddock plan. And that's a really easy way then of communicating it to others that we might want to work with, or making sure that we've got it there really visual for us and whoever else is working with us on a day-to-day -day basis. Pretty simple, but we can note out the things that are going on in that paddock, where the risk areas are, what we put in place to manage it. And of course it can be a useful tool also if you're wanting to get away, someone else to take over, if you need to get away, there's some material documented there already for you to hand to someone else. You'll be well familiar that earlier this year the government came out and delayed the winter grazing regulations. Enabled agriculture to have another 12 months to put some things in place around uh, winter grazing but they came out with some fairly blunt, and blunt uh, expectations. The Minister expects a complete stop to the worst practices that impact on the environment, to see farmers put in place better practices and that there will be evidence that significantly less sediment and other contaminants ending up in our waterways. And I believe with the work that you're doing and has been done that that is happening. We've seen really good documentation of winter grazing plans. We've seen good uptake of material to make sure that we've got good evidence to what we're doing in regard to that space. But our real opportunity now is how we make sure that we have got that documentation and planning in place as we start thinking now, not only about feeding our stock tomorrow, but planning next winter's crops and what we might do with those. And so the opportunity we have as New Zealand Agriculture right now is to make sure that we plan that really well so that as we head into next year and the regulation becomes more certain, that that can be around a way that is easy and practical and straightforward on farm. 
we don't want to be in a situation where we require uh, many, many consents, which is the alternative that sits in front of us. So government has given us an extra time frame to make sure that we plan ahead and are ready. And there's lots of really good resources available across the agriculture uh, sector, Dairy NZ, Beef and Lamb, Fonterra, uh, to help with documenting those things. Thriving Southland as well, my apologies, you've also contributed a lot towards that space. So make sure we are using those resources, documenting what you're doing, planning ahead to minimise the risks from winter grazing. Move on to Hiwaki Kanawa. And just to break things up a little bit, I'd like to ask some of you to stand up. And you'll find out why in a moment. So, can, starting from this side of the room, every fourth person, can you stand up please? So, Rachel, the next fourth person, everyone, every fourth person across each row, stand up for me please. Thank you. You can sit down now. But what you've just done is contributed to what New Zealand agriculture needs to do to meet our Hiwaki Ekanoa milestones. You see, 25% of us have to know our greenhouse gas numbers by the end of this year. And 25% of us, one in four of you as you stood up, have to have a plan to measure and manage your greenhouse gas emissions by the end of this year, effectively. Although the wording says 1 January. 2022, effectively the end of this year, 25% of us is New Zealand agriculture. Which means if you're not doing it, you need someone around you, 25% of us, to be doing it to make sure we meet our Hiwaki Kanoa milestones. And for those of you reading ahead, as you see down the bottom, there's a very clear directive to New Zealand agriculture. If we can get this right, we can have a better mechanism for addressing greenhouse gas emissions on farm. Uh, if we can get this right, if we don't, the ETS is sitting there as a backstop. And so it's our opportunities, we heard a little bit earlier, to get this right, to make sure we're contributing, doing our part. But a part of it is that middle piece that says a quarter of farms have a, green, have a written plan in place to measure and manage the greenhouse gas, uh, gas emissions. Well, what does that look like? So let me show you uh, a little of what that could be. These are the four things that are documented in the Hiwaki Kanoa guidance in terms of uh, greenhouse gas plans. So firstly, know your numbers. Fairly straightforward if you need to you know, plan something, it's useful to know where you start from, isn't it? And there's a range of ways that we can get our greenhouse gas numbers. Then we need to identify opportunities to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and capture carbon, and or capture carbon. Then choose the actions that you're going to follow and keep records, monitor and review. Relatively simple and straightforward, but the process of thinking about where can I be more efficient on farm, where can I uh, reduce some of my emissions if I can, where can I sequester more carbon if I can, thinking through that is really, always really valuable because we might find some opportunities that have been sitting there that we haven't thought of. There will be some of us where you've already implemented those things, you've captured those opportunities already, and so we also want to document that as well. But we want to look for within our greenhouse gas farm plan, where are the opportunities and ways that we can be more efficient, where can we capture some value, where can we make sure we've got evidence of those things. So that's what a greenhouse gas farm plan is likely to look like, likely to require, likely to include on farm. For the other 75% of you that rely on everyone else to do it for this year, we all actually need to do this by the end of 2024. So this is not something that is just us, some of us have to, it's just some of us have to do it this year, the rest of us have got a little longer time frame. And the other part um, of farm planning that's really um, top of mind for many of us is the certified freshwater farm plan component. And this is still very much in development but don't, we shouldn't let that uh, allow us to think it's some time away and, and we don't need to think about it too much at this point in time. Certified freshwater farm plans are in the essential freshwater regulations. They're still under development. We're expecting some consultation material to come out shortly, and the outcome of that to be known later this year, maybe early next year. But it is likely to require, in some catchments, 
certified freshwater farm plans in place in the middle of next year or shortly thereafter. So that is going to come to some of us much sooner than it would otherwise come through the Regional Council plan requirement. So we need to be mindful of it. We need to be thinking ahead in terms of that. Someone I spoke to recently used the phrase regulation ready. It's not a bad way to think about it. Have I got things in place that I've got my farm and my business lined up that I can address what may come out of the finalisation of some of these things at the time that it comes? So what do we know about what might be in a freshwater farm plan? Well, what we do know is it's likely to ask for us to produce or provide or have available a map identifying some of those risk areas. That's fairly straightforward, isn't it? We've probably done that. Maybe we haven't documented it in quite the manner that we may now, but we'll have some form of map available and we can identify on it those risk areas. Also likely to need a risk assessment around some of the practices that we do on farm that may contribute more risk to the environment than what we otherwise have. And what are the actions that we've put in place or that we're thinking about in terms of reducing those? So here's a quick example. Hope that's clear enough that you can see of a farm that has already done that. Here's the farm map. Here's the waterways identified. And this farm has identified an action, not for straight away, but an action for over the next four or five years, start working towards you know that wet boggy area that's always a pain, never grows very much. Actually, we can start thinking about fencing it off and turn that, let that revert back into a wetland. And so the reality, the great thing for most of you, is that you'll actually be well on the way to already meeting what's likely to be required in many of these, for many of these requirements. Most of you will have good maps. Most of you will have uh, identified the risk areas. You'll know the risks. You'll have actions in place. And so we may need to collate that in a different manner to what we've done in the past, but we'll have it there. And that's what we want to help you do. Those of us who don't work on farm but work in agriculture, we're here to help make sure we've got those things in place to help you meet those additional things. So the critical things, we're looking to further document details of your farm business. That's really what the increased focus on farm planning is about further documenting the things that you've got going on, the uh, documenting details of your farm business. Collating the material together so it's an easy way to reference, easily accessible. And sometimes re-evaluating parts of our farm system where there may be greater efficiencies that we can implement. Those are the critical opportunities out of farm planning. So let me leave you with this again. Our goal is that every commercial farm has a recorded active farm plan. The, um, the planning process is cost effective and streamlined, and plans aid decision making. Farm plans should be about helping make sure we uh, have a more, more resilient business, a better business. We've got things in place to meet our consumer and regulatory requirements. Remember, plans are nothing, it's the process of planning that is everything. Thank you very much.